Gold Derby here with Fernando Mireles. Uh, he's the director of the new film, The Two Popes. And Fernando, you know, what's so interesting about your filmography is that you really never make the same film twice. Uh, I think, like, knowing that this is from the same guy who made City of God and The Constant Gardener would be pretty surprising to people. So, I mean, what about this movie uh, appealed to you and made you want to tackle it? Actually, was was the character, was Pope Francis. The film, uh, at first, was a film on Pope Francis. And then, when they invited me, I couldn't be involved. I was doing the opening of the Olympics in Rio, which took me two years. And when I finished, they, they had a script, and, and was script was, was about Pope Francis, but in a conversation with Pope Benedict. It was a very good script, so I jumped in. But I like Pope Francis a bit for the same reason that I, I shot Seed of God, because he talks about uh, the soci dystopic society that we're building and uh, in social exclusion and, and all his politics. I like, I agree with his point. So, right. so in some ways connected to, to my other films. What's so interesting, I mean, you're known for making very visually visceral movies. Um, and this is a movie, you and, and Anthony McCartney do a lot to open up the film, as it were, but the real heart of it is in these conversations between Pope Benedict and Pope Francis. Was that part of the appeal to you to try to make cinematic this, what is essentially, you know, just a conversation piece? Well, actually, it was not part of the appeal, it was part of the challenge. <laughs> right. Because the dialogue was very nice when I read it, I said, well, I, it's, it's very good dialogue, I want to do this. But then, when I signed, I realized that in the end of the day, the film was only two guys talking and, and a lot about religion and the church. That could be very uh, boring, I would say. And uh, so my challenge was how to make this cinematic and, and, and interested and, and even entertaining. And, and my bet was uh, try to make it very intimate. So I, I told myself, instead of making a film about a pope talking to a cardinal, I want to make a film about two men that disagree in everything, trying to find the common ground. Very personal, very intimate, the camera is very close to them, there's a lot of jokes, and, and so you see two men that happens to be one pope and, and the other one who became a pope. And, uh, and I think it was a good choice because you really understand who's behind that uh, white uh, Cossack. You talk about how these two men disagree with each other, and, and I mean, certainly <laughs> finding common ground is uh, very important right now, not yeah, just no, in this yeah. country, but all over the globe. Yeah, I mean. toler tolerance is, I mean, it's a, it's a commodity that we're missing a lot in, in the planet. <laughs> I mean, and this whole idea of, of uh, populism and nationalism that is, is this wave in the whole world, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite scary. And Pope Francis is the guy who's trying to build bridges, I mean, put down the walls and build bridges between uh, nations and, and religions and societies. And so I like that very much. You talked about um, agreeing with Pope Francis. Um, obviously, Pope Benedict is on the polar opposite of a lot of what Pope Francis is, is talking about. Um, in terms of finding a way to represent his character, to, to identify with his character, was that, was that a challenge? Or, I mean, how did you approach that? For Benedict. Yes. Sir. Yeah. No. Uh, when I first read the script, for me it was very clear. It was a film. It was the good pope and the bad, the bad pope. That was in my first reading. And then when I start preparing it, and, and I understood uh, more of uh, Pope Benedict's point, and he has a point. I mean, he's one of the most important intellectuals of the century, and uh, and I understand what, what what he says, and, and I like some of his sermons. I still, I mean, uh, I would vote for Pope Francis, but uh, it became much more like a gray area, you know? And, uh, and then Anthony Hopkins came on board, and he also understands Pope Benedict, and, and he, he, I mean, he has such a charisma that gave the Pope Benedict this, this charisma that Hopkins has. So you watch the film, and you don't dislike Pope Benedict anymore. It's very balanced, you know? You can agree with one or with the other, and, uh, but this was really, I think, mostly thanks for, for Hopkins' performance. Right. Um, talk a little bit more about working with the actors. I mean, uh, both Anthony Hopkins and uh, Jonathan Price as Pope Francis. I mean, obviously this movie has to succeed <laughs> on the backs of the actors. Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about working with them and, and creating that, um, that chemistry, that dynamic between the two of them. Yeah, there, there, there was the, 
I mean, working with those two actors is it's, it's quite easy in some way because they, they bring I mean, a vision of the characters. And so what I would do is, is more was asking them, how do you prefer this? Would you feel okay walking here? I mean, always asking more than telling them what to do. The only thing that I was just insisting all the time was this idea of being very, very small, very, don't say the lines like big statements, just throw it away. Even in the, there was a crazy idea that I think it worked. The, the big line in the film is when Benedict tells Francis that he's gonna resign. Benedict, uh, Francis is the first person, at that point was Cardinal Bergoglio. It's the first person for whom he's telling his idea of resigning, resignation. But he says in a way that it's quite risky way. He says, you know, uh, I'm gonna resign. Well, this marble is cold and he walks away. It's like he was saying nothing. Like he's gonna say, today it's gonna rain. And which is a crazy, I mean, if you read, this is the big statement of the film and we just throw it away. But it works so well. I mean, it becomes so alive. And uh, anyway, we found this kind of trick to make it really easy and, and, and people engage with the story. In terms of opening it up, I think one of the uh, one of the things that is most beneficial telling the story cinematically is that you're able to uh, show flashbacks into Pope Francis's life and into the things that you know led him to the priesthood. Was that part of uh, you? How did those end up being in the script? Were they in there originally, or was that something that you kind of worked with McCartan to? No, actually, in the first draft, we, we had much more flashbacks. We had the, we, we would first meet him in his when he was nine. Then again, when a teenager, we would follow him through his life. And then in the end, we start working on the script and and in the cut, and then we just used a chunk. Uh, Pope, Pope Francis uh, made really big mistakes when he was a cardinal in, in, in Buenos Aires. And so we explore this, this, this event with the junta. He was uh, related to his, his relationship with the junta, the military junta, the dictator, dictatorship in Argentina. So we explore this, his, his mistakes, but we felt that we didn't need to show his whole life, just that, bit, that part. And uh, I think we got it right. We showed the, the segment, it's a big chunk in the film, for the Argentinians, and they really responded well to, the, to, to, to this whole sequence. I'm from Brazil. Brazil had the same issue. We had a very brutal dictatorship, not as brutal as Argentina, but uh, I grew up listening to stories on torture and all that, so I think it was emotionally equipped for the, for the job. Okay. Um, I also really appreciated the way that you brought a lot of scope into the film, uh, particularly when you see the Vatican in Rome through Pope Francis' eyes. You know, I mean, it really, uh, you see the splendor and the grandeur of it, and you experience that through his eyes. You know, can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, there, there, there's, a, there's a funny, actually, we, we'd never shot inside the Vatican because okay. we weren't allowed. So it's all shot around Rome in different palaces. And, and the main set for the film is the Sistine Chapel that we built a replica, perfect replica okay, in, in Chinichita. But uh, yeah, but we do have this moment of, of Pope Francis, I mean, staring all, all this, but he has like a, a critical look. It's like he's watching all this, looking at all these big marbles and all things and say, how many money spent here? And uh, how, what a waste. In the end of the film, well, we have a, a sequence of, which he guides a, a bunch of, uh, of refugees to visit the Vatican, which really happened. He did, did that. And, uh, and so we improvised a bit. It was a shame that we had to cut. But what, what uh, uh, Jonathan would say was, you see that all this painting, it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> I was always showing that you, yeah. you think that, uh, look at this, it's marble, it's, we could buy it. And, you know, it's criticizing the whole wealth of the church. It's funny because you think he's showing how beautiful. No, see, ridiculous. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's what's interesting about your, your approach to it visually. is like you really do put the audience into the uh, shoes or the rope, if you will, <laughs> of, um, <laughs> of, of Francis. And I mean, that is a part of the, the uh, conflict between him and Benedict. Like when he goes to Benedict's house 
This is huge. You know, palace. Yeah, you know, it's a palace. For a yeah, billionaire. Yeah, yeah. Castel Gandolfo. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a palace. Now, uh, this was was the summer residence. Okay. It's the first sequence happens in the summer residence, and when when Pope Francis took over, he decided not to use that summer residence anymore and became a, a, like a museum. So you can pay and visit, but nobody, he doesn't go there anymore. And, and it's just a public place. So he really believes in what he says. Yeah. Um, you know, the film has been uh, connecting with audiences worldwide. I mean, you guys have won a bunch of audience awards. Yeah. At various film festivals. Five audience yeah. awards so far. <laughs> <laughs> what do you account for the um, lack of, uh, what do you account for the, um, for the amount of, love and interest for this movie. I mean, you would think that it would be something that's very, um, you know, has a very select audience, right? But it's sort of finding its audience, you know, all around the globe and in different walks of life. What do you account for that? Yeah. I have to say that I was surprised because when I, when I signed for the film, I thought it was a film for a niche, or well, a big niche, a Catholic church and all that. But then, I mean, I, I'm, I was surprised to see that everybody engages to the film. And I believe that there's, because there's a lot of uh, levels for you to, to get uh, engaged. I mean, there's a, this personal level that I was talking about, the, the tolerance, the idea of tolerance, that we, it's like we really need that uh, nowadays, so everybody respond to that. The idea of forgiveness and self-forgiveness, because not only Pope Francis had done really stupid things in his <laughs> youth, but uh, also Pope Benedict. So both of them have to, to self-forgive themselves and, and absolves the other. So that's something everybody, have, everybody have done stupid things, right? Oh, sure. So you relate to, to your guilt and all that. But there's also a second level, which is a political level, which is uh, Pope Francis' agenda. He, he criticized the economic system that makes a very unfair society, and, and anybody can relate to that. And even in, in the other level, the spiritual level, we don't talk about Catholic uh, beliefs, we talk about talk about relation with God or no matter which kind of God even if you do yoga sometimes you do yoga and you feel that you're very connected and and, and, and sometimes you do your yoga and you don't feel anything you're just seated there so we talk about this that the moment when in any religion you lose the connection in the film we call it the narc the dark night of the soul and this is the name of a, a book or a poem from John of the Cross is a, a theologian from, from Spanish from the 16th century that tells that everybody who believes in God at some point you lose the connection and you have to go through this night, long night might, might last like 10 years might last like three weeks doesn't matter but you have to go through and wait because at some point God will connect to you again anyway we talk a lot about this so even in the spiritual level it's, we talk in a way that everybody can connect no matter if you're Jewish if you're Muslim or whatever. So it really, the audience responded. Good for us. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you a couple of other things just about your career. Uh, you got an Oscar nomination for City of God 16 years ago. What's so interesting is that, you know, your film was eligible in the uh, foreign film category uh, the year before. Got no, your, it wasn't. It wasn't? No, oh, well, no, it got, no. well, it was like, it yeah, was, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, there was a, there was a kerfuffle about it. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it so it was not was not nominated, obviously, for. So I, yeah, and I thought it was gone. And yeah. then next year. Yeah, next year you get nominated, and it gets these three other major nominations. I mean, that must have felt pretty vindicating, right? I mean, <laughs> for it to not you know to uh, to not get nominated for the foreign film category, but then to be called one of the best directed, best written, best edited, best shot films of, of the year. Yeah, and, and it was you know it was a big surprise for me at that time. I was working on the Constant Gardener. And so in the beginning of the year, uh, uh, Miramax called me and said, oh, we want to make a campaign because I think we think that the film deserves. And, and, uh, and I said, uh, whatever, I'm working on something else. I won't have time to do anything. So do what, what uh, you do. Thank you very much. But I won't, I won't travel. I won't do anything. And I just forgot. So I was actually uh, working on, on, on the Constant Garden one day, by chance with a meeting with John Le Carré. And the producer comes in the room and says, Fernando, you've got four nominations. Well, I didn't even know that, uh, you know, I was in the run. 
Yeah. It's always some good news. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly it helped bring the film to a wider audience. I mean, I mean, it uh, opened in my town like the weekend after the Oscar nominations came. Yeah, out. no, it helped. Yeah. It helped a lot to film, and of course, my, my career. It's, yeah. it's like a good stamp that you have in your right? Yeah. And you got a Golden Globe nomination for The Constant Gardener immediately after that. Yeah. Um, talk a bit about what that recognition meant, and, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, why that film was the right one to follow up City of God with. Yeah, no, it was, uh, I mean, the, actually the, the film that really put me on the, on the map, I think, was City of God was very well received. We got like 54 international awards, I mean, no complaining. But I think only when I, I made this film in English, The Constant Gardener, is that the international market said, well, this guy can, can uh, shoot in English. And, and then I start getting more and more Offers, but I had my life in Brazil, so I, I I wanted to be back. I wanted to shoot in Portuguese. In the last years, I've been been working on, on TV series in Portuguese. Then, I, as I said, I worked on, on the opening of the Olympics two years, and now I'm, I'm back. I think I'm doing a couple of uh, films in English again. What are you working on now? Talk about? I'm working on another project for Netflix already. Hopefully, to shoot next year. Uh, I won't tell you the story, but it, it's on, on the climate crisis. I'm, okay. I'm completely obsessed with this, this theme. I, mean, I think we, I'm very pessimistic, to be honest. Yeah. And uh, so the, the challenge is how to, to talk about it in a way that people will, like this film, that people will engage and, and listen, not, not reject, mm -hmm. as we do any time we hear about climate. We don't want to deal with this, this it's quite scary. Well, Fernando, thank you so much. You got another winner on your hands. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.